Section 1. Introduction. Last video, we asked whether or not a rational prime p factorised further inside z adjoin root 2. This turned out to be equivalent to asking whether or not 2 was a square mod p. But calculating all the squares mod p is time consuming if p is large, or if we need to do this for lots of primes p. But it turns out we don't need to. We were also able to show that, excluding the easy case when p equals 2, this just boils down to asking whether or not p is plus or minus 1 mod 8. This now answers our question for all primes p simultaneously. In showing this, we used a crucial trick. We noticed that root 2 was equal to a certain sum of roots of unity. It was equal to zeta plus zeta inverse, where zeta is e to the 2 pi i over 8, a primitive 8th root of unity. This then allowed us to evaluate root 2 to the power p plus 1 in two different ways mod p. On the one hand, it's 2 to the p minus 1 over 2 times 2. Uh, mod p, Euler's criterion, tells us that this first factor is exactly plus or minus 1, depending on whether 2 is a square mod p. So in total, we get plus or minus 2. And on the other hand, writing root 2 as zeta plus zeta inverse, this is zeta plus zeta inverse to the p, times zeta plus zeta inverse, and the binomial expansion of this first factor here is particularly simple mod p. We can use the cyclic nature of the powers of zeta to calculate this expression directly as either plus or minus 2 depending on the value of p mod 8. And now we just match the signs. Our next question was, can we do the same in other unique factorization domains? Whether or not p factorizes in z adjoin root 3 comes down to asking whether or not 3 is a square mod p. So can we find a similar trick here that will give us a simple answer for all primes p simultaneously in terms of congruences? If we can, what about other unique factorization domains, like z adjoin root 7 or z adjoin root 11? For example, it would be nice to be able to find an expression for root 3 or root 7 as some kind of sum of roots of unity, though it's not quite obvious how. But if we did achieve this, we could raise both sides of this equation to the power p plus 1. And then perform the same trick, we evaluate it mod p in two different ways, one using Euler's criterion, and the other using the binomial theorem. In this video, we'll focus on finding suitable expressions like this. Section 2. Patterns among the squares. It's not quite clear where to start. So let's just begin by gathering some data on which numbers are squares mod p. I'm going to put positive integers n along the top, odd primes p down the left-hand side, and I'm going to fill in this table with a plus sign if n is a square mod p, and a minus sign if n is not a square mod p. You could use ticks and crosses, but this will be helpful later. For example, I've just calculated all the squares mod 13. They're 1, 3, 4, 9, 10, and 12. That means all the other integers between 1 and 12, that's 2, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 11, are not squares mod 13. And I've stopped at this point because we've reached 0 mod 13, so after this point the pattern just repeats itself. Here are the non-zero squares mod 3, actually the only one is 1, so 2 must be a non-square. The non-zero squares mod 5 are 1 and 4, which leaves 2 and 3 to be non-squares. Mod 7, they're 1, 2, and 4, which leaves 3, 5, and 6 to be non-squares. Mod 11, they're 1, 3, 4, 5, and 9. And mod 17. Mod 19. And so on. Here's a pattern that will be really important for us. Each row has the same number of plus signs as minus signs. We'll use that later. A more complex fact is the following. If we fix a single row, in other words, we fix a single prime number p, the plus and minus signs in that row are distributed multiplicatively. And what I mean by that is, if you know the signs of two entries in a row, say a and b, then you know the sign of their product, a times b. A square times a square is a square. A square times a non-square is a non-square. And this last row might come as a surprise, the product of two non-square numbers mod p will always be a square number mod p. You might like to have a think about why this is true. As a hint, I discussed something very similar in video 5. So 
So in particular, the sine of A times the sine of B is the sine of AB. By the way, this also explains why some of the rows are symmetric and others are anti-symmetric. Multiplying by minus one is gonna flip a row from left to right. So if minus one is a square mod P, then flipping a row will preserve its signs. Whereas if minus one is a non-square, then flipping a row will invert all its signs. We won't spend too much time on these facts in this video. They'll be important to keep in the back of your mind, but for now, let's take them as given and move on. Section three, a few small cases and trigonometry. Last video, we found a clever decomposition of root two into roots of unity, zeta plus zeta inverse. Since these zetas were eighth roots of unity, I'm gonna decorate them with some subscript eights. As this decomposition played such a crucial role in the argument, for the rest of this video, we'd like to see whether we can find a similar decomposition for root q for other prime numbers q. Rings of the form z adjoin zeta, I'll call it zeta n, where zeta n is a primitive nth root of unity, say e to the two pi i over n, are called cyclotomic extensions of z. We've seen a few of these already. When n equals two, we're adjoining a primitive square root of one. That's just minus one, so we get nothing new. Z looks like this. When n equals four, we're adjoining a primitive fourth root of one, such as i, and z adjoin i looks like this. When n equals eight, we're adjoining a primitive eighth root of one. I can't draw the full picture here because as we said last time, its lattice picture is really four dimensional, but let's just draw a few of the important points in the complex plane. Let's draw the eighth roots of unity. Now we can use trigonometry to calculate the coordinates of this point. It's just one plus i over root two. And now we can see where the square root of two might come from. There's actually another cyclotomic extension we've already seen. Z adjoin a primitive cube root of unity, which we've usually called omega in the past. Remember that it looks like this. It's a lattice made up of equilateral triangles in the complex plane. Well, now we can use trigonometry to calculate the coordinates of this root of unity too. It's minus one plus i root three over two. So we've stumbled across a root three. This time, zeta minus zeta inverse is i times root three. We could divide by the i if we wanted to, but for now, let's just leave this as it is and move on. This might embolden us to look at other small cyclotomic extensions of z. For example, we haven't yet seen z adjoin zeta five. Again, its lattice picture is too big to draw here, so I'm just gonna draw the fifth roots of unity and see if we can use trigonometry. Now, we haven't talked about it much in this course, but some of you may have spotted where this is going. These five roots of unity form a regular pentagon, and you might happen to know that the geometry of pentagons is related to the golden ratio, the number I briefly mentioned in video eight and called phi. The ratio of a side to a diagonal of a pentagon is one to phi. And you may remember that I said that phi was equal to one plus root five over two. So this seems like good news. But even if you don't know that, here's a trick to calculate the coordinates of zeta. We're gonna use the fact that the sum of all of these five roots of unity is equal to zero. Let's write zeta equals x plus i y so that it's conjugate, zeta inverse is x minus i y, and then zeta plus zeta inverse is two x. If we square both sides of this expression, we get zeta squared plus two plus zeta to the minus two is two x all squared. Now, if we add these two equations and subtract one, we force the left-hand side to be equal to the sum of all five roots of unity. So it must be equal to zero. The right-hand side is now two x squared plus two x minus one. This gives us a quadratic equation in two x which we can solve to find that x is minus one plus root five over four. So the x-coordinates of these two points are minus one plus root five over four, and a similar trick tells us that the x-coordinates of these points are minus one minus root five over four. If we play around with this for a second, we'll see that we can write root five as zeta minus zeta squared minus zeta cubed plus zeta to the four. Okay, this is looking promising, so let's try z adjoin zeta seven. The seventh roots of unity look like this. And if we write zeta equals x plus i, y, I'll leave you to check using the same trick as before that we get the equation 2x all cubed plus 2x all squared 
minus 2 times 2x minus 1 equals 0, now a cubic equation in 2x. Now there are methods available to solve cubic equations, but we can already see that this equation is quite nasty and they're only going to get worse quickly. So let's try something else. Section 4. Distributing the sines. Looking at z adjoined zeta 3, we found this. i times root 3 equals plus zeta minus zeta squared. So a plus sign here and a minus sign here. This makes sense. In order to end up on the imaginary axis, all the real parts in our sum will have to cancel out. So giving these conjugate roots of unity opposite signs is a good plan. For zeta 5, we found this. Root 5 is plus zeta minus zeta squared minus zeta cubed plus zeta to the 4. In this case, we ended up on the real axis, so we gave conjugate roots of unity the same sign so as to cancel out the imaginary parts. Maybe we can just try something like this for zeta 7. With a bit of trial and error, we might stumble across a combination of plus and minus signs that gives us a square root of 7. For example, let's put plus signs here, minus signs here, and minus signs here. So plus zeta, minus zeta squared, minus zeta cubed, minus zeta to the 4, minus zeta to the 5, plus zeta to the 6. Conjugate roots have the same sign, so the imaginary parts will cancel out and this will end up on the real line. Is it root 7? Well, let's call it tau. I'm going to square it and see if I get 7. And so that I don't get lost, I'm going to multiply term by term using a table. So I'll give each term of tau its own row and its own column. Let's multiply everything together. And let's add. Now it's a bit messy and we'll see a neater version of this idea later, but for now, let's just add along these diagonals where similar terms live. I end up with this. And by using the fact that all the roots of unity sum to zero, we can rewrite this as 7 plus something. Now, is this something non-zero? Well, just from the diagram of where the roots of unity lie in the complex plane, you can kind of estimate, and it looks to me as though this number is going to be to the right of the origin, so probably not. Okay, so that didn't quite work. Let's try different combinations of plus and minus signs now. This is tedious, but it's easy, and due to the symmetries, lots of the calculations are redundant. So there are really only three cases that we need to check with symmetric signs, that'll send us to the real axis and four with anti-symmetric signs that will send us to the imaginary axis. Each one will only take a few minutes to calculate. If we stick with it, eventually we get to this arrangement, which gives us this value for tau. And now let's square it. Finally, we see that tau squared equals minus seven. So tau equals plus or minus i root seven. And again, looking at the diagram of the complex plane, you can work out that it's probably minus i root 7. So we've dealt with z adjoined zeta q for q equals 3, 5, and 7. Now, in each case, we've assigned to all the non-trivial qth roots of unity some plus or minus signs. Then we've added up the qth roots of unity times those signs. We've called that number tau, and we've squared it. We get either plus q or minus q in each case. And maybe you've seen the connection between the first part and the second part of this video. The plus and minus signs seem to be distributed along the roots of unity exactly as they were in the table at the start. Notice that when q is 5, we get a symmetric distribution of signs, and we end up on the real axis. In other words, tau squared is positive. And when q is 3 or 7, we get an anti-symmetric distribution of signs. We end up on the imaginary axis, so tau squared is negative. What about the next primes, say 11 or 13? Well, we could conjecture that this pattern will continue to hold. Take the 11th and 13th roots of unity, give the nth one a plus or minus sign according to whether n is a square or not, and you should get values of tau that square to minus 11 and plus 13. You could check these by hand using the table method if you wanted to, and you should find that they do in fact work. So we could generalize this conjecture at this point. Let zeta be a qth root of unity, and attach a plus sign to zeta to the n if n is a square mod q, and a minus sign if n is not a square mod q, for all n between 1 and q minus 1. Okay, add all these up, and then call the result tau. 
Then our conjecture is the following. Tau squared equals plus Q if the signs are symmetrically distributed and minus Q if they're anti-symmetrically distributed. Let's refine this a little bit. Starting with this plus or minus symbol up here, as a piece of formal notation, I'm going to introduce the Legendre symbol, n over q. This looks like a fraction, but I'm always going to put it in square brackets to remind you that it's not a fraction. It's just a symbol standing for a coefficient, and that coefficient is going to record exactly this plus or minus sign that we've been associating to n mod q. So it's equal to plus 1 if n is a square mod q, and minus 1 if n is not a square mod q. So let's make that substitution in what we've written. Next, remember that the signs are symmetrically distributed precisely when minus 1 is a square mod q, or in terms of the Legendre symbol, when minus 1 over q equals plus 1. And they're anti-symmetrically distributed when minus 1 is not a square mod q, in other words, when minus 1 over q is minus 1. So in both cases, our conjecture is just that tau squared equals minus 1 over q times q. So let's neaten this up a little bit. Now the proof of this should just be a calculation, but it is a tricky one. So let's see how to do it step by step. Keep the Legendre symbol in mind throughout because we're going to use it a lot. Section 5. The proof. Well firstly a remark about Legendre symbols. We noticed earlier that the plus and minus signs were distributed multiplicatively in rows. That is, a row of our table, say the row corresponding to Q, might look like any one of these four options. The sign of A times the sign of B is the sign of AB. And we can write this using Legendre symbols. A over Q times B over Q equals AB over Q. Legendre symbols are multiplicative in the top argument. Also, the symbol a over q tells us whether a is a square mod q. In other words, the top number a in the symbol a over q is always being considered mod q. We can always replace it by anything else that's equal to a mod q. Now let's go back to our table from earlier, where we calculated tau squared when q equals 7. Basically, we'd like to do this for all primes q, but it's a bit of a mess in this format, so we're going to have to rearrange things a bit. Firstly, all of these plus and minus signs are really Legendre symbols mod 7. So let's put that information back in. By definition, the coefficient of zeta to the n in tau is n over 7. I'll put that here and here. And then when we multiply any two elements together, the top numbers of their Legendre symbols multiply. We could then reduce the top numbers of these symbols mod 7 if we want to. But in fact, we'll hold off on this until later. Now, I'll reorder this table in a second to make it easier to sum. So let's just take note of how the table is currently laid out by writing a key. In the row corresponding to a over 7 zeta to the a, and the column corresponding to b over 7 zeta to the b, we've just multiplied the two elements together to get a b over 7 times zeta to the a plus b. Okay, this is our old table, and in a few minutes we'll have a new reordered table. We're going to multiply the same elements together, but in each row we're going to multiply them together in a different order. Here's a diagram of the order we're going to use. So we've got rows and columns. In row 1, everything's going to stay the same. Cell 1 contains entry 1, cell 2 contains entry 2, and so on. Generally, cell n contains entry n. In row 2, I'm going to take every second entry modulo 7. What I mean by that is cell 1 will contain entry 2, cell 2 will contain entry 4, cell 3 will contain entry 6, cell 4 will contain entry 8. But before you complain that this row never had 8 entries in it to begin with, I'm going to remind you that I mean 8 mod 7, in other words entry 1. Cell 5 will contain entry 10 mod 7, in other words 3 and cell 6 will contain entry 12 mod 7, in other words, 5. So cell n contains entry 2n. In row 3, I'm going to take every third entry modulo 7, so 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, and 18. Cell n contains entry 3n, and all of these entry numbers are taken modulo 7. And so on. Notice that even though the elements in each row have swapped around, they're all still there, and they're all still there exactly once. 
For example, row 4 still contains entries 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, just in a different order. Why is that? How can we ensure that that's always true? Well, let's continue to take row 4 as an example. If cell n contains entry 4n, mod 7, how can I prove that some specific entry, say entry number e, occurs in some cell somewhere? It seems a bit silly to say that entry e should be found in cell a quarter times e, but remember that this is arithmetic modulo 7, where division by 4 makes sense, as we discussed in video 10. Since 4 times 2 is 1 mod 7, division by 4 is just multiplication by 2. So we have mutually inverse correspondences between cells and entries here, showing that they do match up 1 to 1 as we'd hoped. So, back to our original table, and let's reorder each row according to this diagram. Row 2, and row 3, and row 4, and so on. Okay, this is where we're going to rewrite the top numbers of those Legendre symbols. Look at row 2, for example. I have 4, 8, 12. Notice that I can write the next number as 16 mod 7, the next one is 20, and the next one is 24. Now I have a nice arithmetic sequence along row 2. I'll do something similar in row 3. I've got 9, 18, 27, 36, 45, and 54, mod 7. In row 4 I get multiples of 16, in row 5 I get multiples of 25, and in row 6 I get multiples of 36. If you think about it in terms of this key, that's because in row A, column B, we used to have entry B. But now in the same cell we have entry AB from that row. We've sent B to A times B. So the new entries in our table look like this. And now you can see where the A squared comes from. But remember that Legendre symbols are multiplicative. A squared B over Q is the same as A over Q times A over Q times B over Q or in other words, a over q squared times b over q. But this a over 7 is just plus 1 or minus 1, right? So whichever you start with, when you square it, you get 1. And so a squared b over 7 is just b over 7. Right? So this a squared in the Legendre symbol is redundant. So looking back at the key in the lower right, the next thing we're going to do is get rid of it. What that amounts to is dividing the number on the top of the Legendre symbol by a squared in row a. In other words, by 4 in row 2, by 9 in row 3, by 16 in row 4, and so on. Now finally we can see the point of all this reordering. All the Legendre symbols in each column are equal, and in column n that symbol is just n over q. So now we can just try adding down the columns. Let's ignore the last column for a second. Each column contains zeta, zeta squared, zeta cubed, all the way up to zeta to the 6 in some order. But remember that the sum of all 7 roots of unity is 0, and so the sum of these 6 is just minus 1. That is, the sum down the first column is minus 1 times 1 over 7, down the second column it's minus 1 times 2 over 7, and so on. I'll factorise out that minus 1, and now let's have a look at the last column. Well, firstly, the coefficient here is 6 over 7, or rewriting the top number mod 7, minus 1 over 7. And there are 6 of them. So, minus 1 over 7 times 6. Now, remember from before that each row has the same number of pluses and minuses in it. That is, half of the Legendre symbols are plus 1, and half are minus 1. So, if I add them all up, I get 0. Or in other words, this sum here comes to the negative of the symbol minus 1 over 7. So, substituting that into the bracket above, there we have it, minus 1 over 7 times 7. Now, this was more or less our conjecture from before, but with a 7 instead of a q. Let me write out the conjecture again. The proof strategy I've just shown you works in the general case. So let z to be a qth root of unity. If tau is the sum of n over q times zeta to the n, then tau squared can be written as the product of two copies of this sum. 
or in other words, is this double sum here over a and b. And now convince yourself that we can reorder each row as follows. In row a, cell b of that row, instead of entry b, we're going to put entry ab. Now separate off the last column where b equals q minus 1. You should be able to argue that this column sums to minus 1 over q times q minus 1, and that the rest of the columns sum to minus 1 over q. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to check all the details. We'll come back to how this fits into our theory of prime decomposition next video.